The Blitz is defined as a sudden, savage attack. It is indeed all this. The effect is sure. The premise is simple. It's a basic, primal confrontation. Man to man. No excuses are offered. None accepted. Welcome to the latest edition of Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Looks like a radio station. Now, here are your hosts. Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers. Pure athlete yet. I transcend race, hombre. Matt Butler. I don't talk Man, I back it up. And we are sock full of that. Man. Damn right. And Jeff Howe. It's still real to me, damn it. <laughs> and that's the bottom line. Cause Stone Cold set up. If you're gonna blitz, come strong, but don't come at all. Finally, we've got a game to talk about. No more talking about the off season or camp or no more pontificating about what might happen. We got something of substance to talk about this week. It's Texas and Maryland. Year two of the Tom Herman era gets kicked off on Saturday, 11 a.m. local time at FedEx Field, home of uh, Rod. Which NFL team plays at FedEx Field? Game week, baby. The Washington Racial Slurs play there, baby. Big time. (laughs) Pistolas McCoy. Yeah, um, I'll uh, I'll, nice. let, I'll, I'll I'll let Rod take that one. But uh, anyway, That's true. What do you mean? I mean yeah. I'm trying to be politically correct here. There you go. Only uh, being accurate. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, like that's actually the only <laughs> right yeah, thing. Check to say. the racial slur database. RSDB.org, by the way, real site. I didn't make that up. That's the kind of stuff you get here on Longhorn Blitz with Horns 24-7. I am Jeff Howe. Let me bring in the rest of the team. He's the master of the soundboard, the drop machine extraordinaire, ready for another year viewing from the stands. He'll have his color-coded charts with him on game day. Matt Butler. Matt, what's going on, man? I hope I'm not bringing my charts to game day, but I will have plenty of charts <laughs> after each awesome. If somebody in the stands, <laughs> they go, the stands, oh, man. Chart and stuff. <laughs> if Matt's watching from home, he'll Got have Got my his, Andy Reid costume on. If great. Matt's watching from home, he'll have his charts. There you, you go. Yeah, I did not expect him. with a clipboard and Stands would be classic, actually charting stuff. I forgot where that would go viral. I they saw a hilarious dude dressing all up girl. as an umpire and doing like all the you know the different yeah. like gunning them out. But yeah, coach, that's a whole nother level. Oh, you just sitting there charting out stuff. Dude. <laughs> you know somebody listening to this is playing right? that Tulsa game that's home opener at DKR. Somebody's gonna do it. Yeah, yeah. you know what I mean. No, I agree with that. You know what they should? Oh, okay. You know what? We're going way too far here. All right, you know what? Stick to the script. Let's go. All right, sorry. Speaking of the script, script club, whatever. He's a man of many talents. It's a renaissance man morning, here on the show. Uh, were you really, Rod? Wow. Yeah, we're I got like a take the... on the show about strip clubs and Odell Beckham Jr. So, huh? Yeah. That see, that is why he's the renaissance <laughs> man here on Longhorn Blitz. Lifetime Longhorn, 2002 Youth All American, 2002 semifinalist for the Jim Thorpe Award, fourth round draft choice of the New York Giants back in 2003. Spent his NFL career with the Giants, Lions, Bears, Bucks, Broncos, and a year with the Hamilton Tiger Cats of the CFL. When he was oh. done with football, got himself back to Austin, Texas, under 40 acres, where he earned his degree. His T ring is on the way, and when he gets it, he will wear it proudly. That's right. He's a card-carrying member of DBU, number 21 in your program, number one in your hearts, Mr. Rod Babers. And Rod. Thanks for the intro, brother. We got, good. We've got football to talk I about. I know. I'm feeling, I'm really like hyped up. You can tell. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's game I see, week. I can see the excitement in your yeah, face. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, hyped up. It's game week. High school you know football. I mean? I'm going to yell and scream. You're almost it's blushing. High, yeah, school exactly. football, <laughs> high school football in the great state of Texas starts this week, the regular season. Texas gets yeah. going on Saturday. Uh AM's playing uh who are they playing like Northwestern State or whoever they're playing on Thursday. Oh, oh, oh is that Mac really? Yeah, yeah, I think my, that. Uh, is that the like the road is, what is that, the road runners or something? What are they? Oh man. Northwestern State's the demons. The demons, yeah, yeah, that's right. It's in that's Louisiana, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah Nac- my, is that Nac- Nacatish or yeah, what my, is Nac- n- Yeah, my, my dad went there. Is it yeah. Nacatish or is Nichols Nacatish? I forget. Yeah, uh, I, well, I, random facts. I, I apologize Craig for not Ray having. affected this show. I apologize <laughs> for not having my Southland school's yeah, home base. We all straight. shook hands with Craig Way on the way in here because he's out mm. there hanging out. So that's what happened, really. We Craig Way has infected us. We all yes. try to drop random facts in there. But uh, <laughs> I, I guess yeah, the Aggies kick it off. But Texas gets going on Saturday. The home opener will be a week from Saturday, but uh, guys, this is a game where when we start to break it down, uh, the first thing I want to do is look at the depth chart, and typically... Mm Whether it's been Mac Brown or Charlie Strong or now Tom Herman, that Monday press conference, that first in-season game week press conference is usually reserved for naming a starting quarterback or a a big depth chart reveal. Rod, there wasn't much suspense at all with this thing. Sam Ellinger got announced as the starting quarterback the week prior. We talked about that last week on the show. 
And really, I mean, other than the or next to Derek Kerstetter and Sam Cosme at right tackle, I agree with that one. other than the ongoing battle between Cameron Dicker and Joshua Rallett, Rod, I'm sorry, Chris Nagar is no longer apparently in that kicker oh, competition. Oh, come on. I want kickers with cool names. Well, you can still get Cameron Dicker. Dicker, Dicker the kicker. No, you can Dicker's going to Dicker win the kicker. Cause I, just because his name alone, I want Dicker in there. <laughs> but really, I, I mean. <laughs> that doesn't sound weird. That sounds other, weird. <laughs> other than those two things, though, guys, this depth chart pretty much, I mean, I was at the first fall camp practice, and this is pretty much what that depth chart looked like. I think the most intriguing or, I guess, because now that's, a, that's that, now this is a big thing, right? Did you see the Damon well, Hogerson people statement? Used to, people used to get on Mac for doing it. Now yeah. everybody like has taken it overboard. And yeah, uh, I did see well, Dana Hogerson. Yeah, comment. apparently West Virginia apparently has made it personal. Uh, Dana Hogerson was asked why he had so many ors on his depth chart, and he basically had them almost at every position. And he said, well, Tennessee, they ord us first, and they put right. a lot of ors on their depth chart is like well so no now it's no point of a depth chart if they're just ors all over the place right. yes. uh, but the the point about tech the, the most intriguing or scenario is the running back position to me i i love really? the fact that there's an or hanging out at uh at right tackle i'm cool with that to me that's depth yeah. <laughs> so you know what i mean that's a good or you know what i mean the running back or is huh so i wonder you know, it's going to be a committee. Like, who, who, how's those carries distributed? It'll be probably 30 carries between those three top guys Trey Watson, um, Keontre Ingram, and Daniel Young. I hope it's closer to 35. It, or could, it should be. 40. It should I be. So. But I know yeah. Sam will get, you know, his four or five little design run probably plays. Probably more and, than that. But and then yeah. he'll have scrambles yeah. that'll get him probably close to 10 carries, too. So I'm just trying to think about that 40 number that I love that last year when Texas rushed for at least, you know, 40 attempts in a game. They were sick. They were undefeated. They were six and zero, yep. and they only won seven games. They were like, "Well, hey, that matters. That's a, that's a, that stat matters to me." I think the I mean? only game they didn't was the Baylor game, and I think they were at thirty eight. Yeah, they were right there. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, just well, just because of what they were last year and the identity of the team, they won with special teams. Long ball Dixon, who based on his NFL performances, guys, I'm freaking out that. He's gonna, the best in football. We're gonna miss him a lot. You know, I mean, no, like, I'm we glad you brought that up. Him yeah. enough that because what he's doing at, at the NFL level now, Peter King is tweeting mm-hmm. about him, and I forgot the stat, but he had he had two 55 yard mm-hmm. punts inside that the were five. down inside the opponent's five. Went out of bounds at the three, each of them. Yes, in that in that uh, this past weekend, and there were only one of those punts last year in the entire season or zero. Well, no, so you had only. Right? A, so he did it twice. He did it in twice. one game in last one year. You game. never had one have punter one do it more than, than once. once. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, so exactly. you had tw- it happened. You had three I think three times. I think, but only guy did it one time per in game. a game. Yeah. Exactly. And he so did what it twice he did, in one game. It, it's insane. Now, so I, I'm afraid that in terms of field position and, and hidden yardage that we're gonna like we're gonna be like wondering like what the hell's going on with the defense and why doesn't it look as mm-hmm. good and it may just because they don't have long ball Dixon pinning people deep like that. And if you just but. take long ball Dixon's adjusted net yards from his punts last year, so you sort of normalize the numbers for the opponents and situation that you're in, do that and then compare him to the average college football player. It was on the SB Nation preview when they broke down like the analytics preview of the Longhorns, they said that it was literally a first down to every single Texas offensive drive. So he was 10 yards in the net better than your wow. collegiate average. Now that's considering all 120 or 130, not all power yeah. five, but still to be a full first down that's insane ahead of the entire competition. Yeah. Like m- the growth of Michael Dixon, I was talking to somebody about this over the weekend. The growth of Michael Dixon was. From oh man, this guy can boom it to man, this guy can like directional kick like a mother. Like oh, uh, why don't you pin the ball left pylon right? that, and kill it at the two yard line? It's like and doing it's trick like, kicks is yes. like a spin yeah. dolly with from the ball from sixty it's yards like, out right. with like the four point eight hang time every throws time. Throws it with his foot like yes. he's that's like, what made like, him special. Like, like people look at we can from down it. under. He's like, the opposite the version. Hell? Yeah, it's crazy. We can look at the net. Got the bloodline at punter. Right. We can look at the net punting average and all that stuff. But to me, that's where you're. Yeah. Miss him. It's like, hey, we need you to pin them inside the five. Can so you do re- that? There's a reason Pete Carroll, one of the best coaches in the NFL, traded up to get yes. him. Mm-hmm. And then one of the best uh, punters in the NFL, who was an old John punter, Ryan. John Ryan, with Seattle, decided, nah, I'm out. <laughs> I've seen this guy at practice. I get it. It's good. You know what I mean? He pulled the John Bonney, like, okay, I see it. Uh, these young guys are legit. So, I, but, but getting back to the initial point about the running backs, I think. 
because Texas has to establish a running game versus Maryland, that is going to be key. Like, and we don't know how it's going to be manufactured. It could be just Sam, the Sam Ellinger show like it was last year. It could be them actually being able to run it in a more traditional form. Maybe they do a lot of, you know, maybe they run a lot of two tight ends since now they have depth at tight end, try to get numbers and leverage. Like, I don't know exactly how they're going to do it. Maybe they do it with a lot of misdirection and and funk, as Brian Harson calls it, pre-snap motions and shifts and movement. But they got to figure out a way to run the ball effectively. That trio of running backs, sometimes, you know, it's a hot hand, too. Like, some some running backs match up better against different defenses. We've seen this before at Texas when we had Brown and Bergeron and, and Gray and, hell, even with Chris Warren and Deontay Foreman. Sometimes, like, oh, this guy against this defense, they can't tackle this guy. They don't want to. Right. You know what I mean? So I see. I, I want to. I, I just want to know how they're going to not regulate it. How they're going to try to uh, you know adjust the, the 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 personnel packages based on the game plans week to week with those guys. Or it's just like whoever becomes the guy, you're the guy. Right. The it's Michael still a competition. The Michael Dixon conversation, Rod, to me blends into that because to me this is my. I've said this about the, the offense all off season, and now we'll get to see if it plays out starting with this Maryland game. And, and I want to talk big picture on the offense <laughs> yeah. here in a second, but. Can the off? Well, let's assume that the defense is going to be in the area code with how good they were last year. And okay. I'm not saying they've got to completely replicate yeah. last year's production, but just don't have your production fall off a cliff. Just yeah. be around where you were last yeah. year. Top twenty, top fifteen defense. Right. Yeah. If you can bank on, you know what you're going to get from your defense game in and game out. The thing with where the wind ceiling is for this team, it's can the offense improve enough to supersede the advantage you no longer have in the kicking game. Yeah. Great like point. you can't that's something I, I, when you talk about teams it's like what can you bank on? Like people say, you know, every time, well, a running game and a run defense that travels every week. Like what can you bank on traveling with you every week? And for Texas last year it was two things, run defense, yep. and Michael Dixon. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You've got the potential to have one of those things still, but you don't have the other. Clearly, yeah. regardless of how good Ryan Bushevsky is, he's, he's like, not going to replicate what Michael not, Dixon gave he's you. Not last now. Year. He at least not this year, because even freshman long ball Dixon wasn't the guy that he was. No, he, he actually mm-hmm. had some shanks yeah. that yeah. Texas fans were yeah. like, well, "It just shows how much you can grow as a player." Right. Yeah. When that happens as a freshman year, you leave early, and what well, you should be still at Texas, arguably the best punter on earth. Yeah. So that to me, Rod, is where the offense conversation starts. Now, going deeper in that, to me, with the run game, and I love you brought this up in the offseason, and I love it. Tom Herman in this offense, and, and we'll talk about that here in a second when we talk about play calling and who's oh, offense. Oh, the play caller conversation. But this Tom Herman offense. You look at his play action passing game, and that's really when his imagination gets fired mm-hmm. up, and you really see them get dynamic I and they're diverse. That. But as you put it so eloquently in the offseason, man, it's hard to have a play action passing game when you can't run the damn ball, which is why, you know, go go to it early in the game. Like when the defense doesn't know your run game sucks yet, go to the it early in the game. The first quarter should have probably a, like a third of their play action passes in the first quarter right. alone. Like just well until you know you have a good running game. Right. So that is why every offense it's pretty much key to run the football in some way shape or form, but for this Tom Herman offense, you in this pro spread system, you've got to be able to establish the run to be able to carry you from one point to the other. Yeah. And that's why, you know, t- the big question for Texas is what's going to be the offensive identity and yeah. we know from year to year it changes, but uh, we know the running game's got to be a part of it. We just don't know exactly how it's going to come to fruition. We have no nobody yeah. has any idea because we brought in Herb Hand. You know he's a co OC and he's supposed to come help some of the pr- power spread principles and bring that to the pro spread. So it, ho- I hope it looks a little different. Tom Tom Herman keeps bragging about you know hey well. Five, you know, for five, uh, five years we haven't had the same offensive system in back-to-back years. Mm-hmm. I hope it's not the same system as last year. I hope it evolves based on the talent and based on you know adjusted based on you know who's who's going to be like the the, the, the guys who are the big playmakers, the dynamic mm-hmm. playmakers. Right. And honestly, unfortunately, I think most of those are at the wide receiving position and not at running back. And that's going to be the challenge with questions at offensive line and questions about your running game and if you can establish it. How do you get the ball to Lil Jordan Humphrey and Colin Johnson, who are the most talented guys on this on this That's offense? where the evolution of this offense comes into play because you know I mean? that slot position in this offense. There, there's two positions where, and I, obviously, clearly, look, 
This is why, to me, the play calling decision hasn't mattered much in the offseason. When you're as bad as Texas was offensively yeah, last done, year, it's yeah. not just one thing. That I don't went give a wrong. damn who's calling the play. Right. Mm-hmm. It, it was a a, a it was system. A, it, was a, it was a it, it was a it was a shiznit show at the cluster fluck factory. There you go. I there, have tried. love the way you very slow careful so that I do not that, get Rod. fired. Quite I've said it on air. <laughs> exactly. And I was like, oh, I gotta say that slow because if I mess that very up, it, how stupid would I would be to get fired over messing up something like it's that. It's like hearing <laughs> Vince Scully talk about in 1949 when he meant to say hot shot hit foul, but he just switched <laughs> exactly. to and he thought he was done. Yeah. And that was what in 1949. The, or what the Cowboys called Tavon Austin, a web back. Yeah. You gotta say that very say slow. slow. Oh, that I've never heard that one. tackle from the TCU. You. They got hurt. What's Ross Black Lock. <laughs> yeah, say Black Lock. Oh, lock. Yes. Yeah, don't, don't say it fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Hum- humor and toilet humor were already in season four. <laughs> uh, but no, Rod, so the two positions in this offense where or that are pivotal to this offense where you really had nothing going for you last year are tight end, which I think we will see more 12 personnel, and yeah. I think you'll see that position be more diverse, and the slot. They really never found the guy they needed in that slot. And again, you think about the guys Tom Herman's had, whether he's been an OC at Rice or Iowa State, Ohio State, or his time at U of H. I mean, at Rice, he had James Casey, mm-hmm. who that they used Probably everywhere. Probably his most versatile Right, they used, was, they used him everywhere. He was a Wildcat quarterback, a yeah. running back, slot, split him out wide, whatever. Uh, you go to Ohio State, and he had to Dontre Wilson and Jalen Marshall mm-hmm. and Philly Brown, some yeah. dynamic, diverse guys. Yeah, those guys. little Percy Harvin guys. He had mm. DeMarcus you know I mean? Ayers at U of H, yeah. just a guy that, hey, it doesn't matter. We're going to get him the ball, and we'll do it a number of different ways because he's that good. Who fits kind of a Lil' Jordan Humphrey mold. That's what Lil' Jordan Humphrey's got to be for this offense. Body. If you want to if you want to maximize what you do on offense, you've got to go in. And I know Tom Herman said on Monday, you know, talking about how many balls are the tight ends going to get. And he's like, well, I don't call the defenses, and you get through a game, and why'd you only get that guy the ball X number of times while the defense was doing this. No, that's your job as an offensive staff is to figure out a way, regardless of what they do, this guy is so good, he needs to touch the ball X number of times, and we've got to scheme ways to get him involved. Yeah, I agree with that. See, but this is supposed to be, okay, so this is to me where a self-scouting um, comes into play, right? You're supposed to be assuming or anticipating the counterpunch. Right. Um, but you got to have an identity to do that. So if you're... if, if if Lou Jordan Humphrey is the main receiver, teams are going to roll coverage his way, and they're going to try to take him away, and that's going to leave them vulnerable somewhere else. And Texas is supposed to be able to take advantage of that, whether it be leaving Colin Johnson in man-to-man coverage, and he's going to be, I don't know, six six inches or eight inches taller and than any of them. DB, yeah. Or it's, you know, th- them guys can't devote numbers to stopping the running game, so they leave themselves vulnerable to you being able to run the football. Those are the types of things that happen when you have a player playmaker that teams try to adjust to they have to defend all right they build a defensive game plan around trying to stop those guys texas right now really doesn't have that if you're going to play texas what do you take away <laughs> ellinger's feet do you know that's why i said this this is why the maryland game is big because you know texas really doesn't know how they're going to maryland's going to attack them you know what i mean and maryland doesn't really know it's kind of a guessing game you almost have to self-coach and go okay if i was them based on what they know about me how would i attack myself how would mm-hmm. i you know what i mean what would be the game plan and if i play texas in terms of defending the offense i'm going to make them show me they can run the ball i'm definitely not going to let sam ellinger start slinging the ball to those wide receivers cuz i can't run with those guys and we ain't got the talent to run with those guys you don't you want him I mean? in the, po- but out of the pocket but we can muck it up yeah, you know what? Show me you can run the ball. So I might come at it with a three man front. You know what I mean? And see if they can run the ball. Texas couldn't run the ball versus three man fronts last they year. They couldn't run it against Maryland. They averaged less than two and a half a carry last you know year. I mean? See like, if Ellinger so can identify. If you're Maryland, you almost coming with the same game plan you had last year. Like, all right, well, they couldn't beat it last year. What may and I know last year a different team, obviously, and we'll get into breaking it down, but you know, what makes me think that they can run it this year because there's been a lot of optimism surrounding the program. They lost Connor Williams. You know what I mean? Like that, you know, so I, I, I think that's going to be the challenge for Tom Herman and this staff and in Maryland game specifically. How, how are you ready for the counterpunch? If they take your, if they take the runaway, how do you manufacture those yards? Do you make the passing game an extension of the running game, turn into a high percentage passing game where you're just getting it to Lou Jordan Humphrey and getting it to uh, the slot wide receivers really quickly and letting them make yards after the catch and yak yards? All right, are you deciding? You know what? We're gonna go twelve personnel. We're gonna put more bodies in the dirt and we're just gonna beat them in the numbers game. We're gonna pound it down in the third. We're gonna run. We're gonna bang our head up against a brick wall. Well, you know what? Sam's gonna be an extension of our running game. We're gonna do bootlegs and waggles and 
Um, we're going to get them outside the pocket, and we're going to run quarterbacks in between the tackles and quarterback power. Like, what's your counterpunch? Because last year, when the fit hit the shan, and your first option was taken off the table because of a good defensive game plan, and you were out coach versus Maryland, probably versus TCU, and probably, honestly, probably versus Texas Tech too. You didn't really have a counterpunch, right? And I want the counterpunch because that's what you're. You're a good coordinator, then, and you're not a good play caller because the difference. Between a good coordinator and play caller, good coordinators can, can construct game plans, they can devise them, they can implement them. Great. Yeah, you know what? That's what Greg Davis was. He was a great coordinator, but he wasn't a great play caller. From that standpoint, and I thought Sean Watson was a good coordinator because yes, his, his opening scripts yes. were really good. But yeah. you're not a great play caller because the play caller That's comes in chaos. the fact you got to use your instincts. Yes, it's more like chaos theory. When 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 there's no game plan, everything's got to be scrapped. You got to go off instincts. You got to be a feel the flow of the game. You gotta you gotta anticipate where Freestyle. it's going. You gotta roll the dice. As it's kind of a rapper. Some rappers they need the lyrics that are written mm-hmm. down. You know what I mean? They, exactly. And they can flow with it. Boom. And they can't freestyle. Mm-hmm. But some rappers, That's they can your do coordinator. Both. They can freestyle and they can write it down and, and they kind of flow in the studio. And <laughs> some Tupac. guys, they can freestyle, but they can't write it up and do it in the studio with the bars and the studio. So it's weird. And I think play caller and coordinators are, are the same thing. And I think sometimes they are both. Sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, guy like Urban Meyer. That's a transcendent says, talent. I'm a, I'm a coordinator. I'm a play caller. But this is what I do. You know, I, mean, I think Lincoln Riley is one of those guys. Um, and I think Tom Herman is one of those guys. And I think that's why people want Tom Herman to take over. Tim Beck, nothing against him. He's not proven to me as a good play caller. That when the team when you makes their adjustments and they take away what you were trying to do and they take away what's supposed to be your identity, then he panics a little bit. And then he's like, all right, well, I'm going to try this and try that. Like, no, be ready for it. Go, okay, I was anticipating y'all was going to do this. Watch me go to work. And you know what I mean? Like, I don't see right. that. Major Applewhite was great at that. Major Applewhite was a good play caller. Like, he he kind of, he, he was ready for the, because it's like it's like a heavyweight fight. So, he was ready for the for the pounder punch. And I don't think Tim Beck is ready for that. He may be this year, though. He may be this year. I don't know if you can grow that overnight. That's instincts. And that's the one no. thing about the Texas offense, just the uncertainty you're talking about. And, like, we just saw that Daily Fantasy came back to college. So I was starting to do a lot of research into just disbursement of targets, things like that. And Texas was one of the few teams that you really still have questions about because something like Trey Watson being added to the equation sort of changes things. Because Tom Herman likes to throw the ball two backs. And when I yeah. started to see some of the better – I mean, Sportsline has Daily Fantasy – projections for college football which Jeff and Horns 24-7 works with and they had Trey Watson I was impressed I was like wow more than 15 carries projected and like almost four receptions so if you're talking 15 carries to him 10 down below and then five maybe to Porter Ingram somebody like that yeah. off the bench that's a, and yeah. that would be a disbursement to where if you have somebody being added to the equation that's giving you the work horse load and being the target out of the backfield to where if you're talking about uncertainty what is the best thing for a quarterback when he doesn't have anything it's that uh, like security that. blanket somebody to dump yeah. down a way that we saw a ca- our running back. remember the catch yeah. rate for Trey Watson 88% around their guy that doesn't drop passes it seems as if if he's earning the or as a starter he gets everything that's involved with the offense and the duties of the position so I mean if you are being having to help with the offensive line and back in pass protect a chip and just being able to identify that soft spot around the quarterback for that dump off pass is so huge and if he can be that to add on to Ellinger's legs that's two ways to extend offenses with pieces that you really didn't think you'd have or knew if you'd get to contribute so if you get that type of production that some people are expecting from him that could be a big bonus I want to focus on the play calling situation just real quick from this standpoint Rod I'm at the point with the Tom Herman, Tim Beck dynamic, kind of where I was with the Charlie Strong, Vance Bedford dynamic. Mm-hmm. You can get on that guy who's got the coordinator title or the play caller title, whatever yeah. title you want to put on him, but the guy in charge, in Charlie Strong's case with the defense or Tom Herman with the offense, like to me, you're almost just wasting your breath because it's ultimately that guy's responsibility. And I know what Tom Herman said in a press conference, and a lot of what's said in yeah. press conference is coach speak. I, mm-hmm. I, as a media member, I understand that. Yeah. But I also understand that, look, 
this is Tom Herman's offense. This pro spread offense, it's his offense, whether he wants to say it's the Texas offense or not. This is his offense. And he is ultimately responsible for what happens, which, which is what he said. Yeah, right. he was he saying it's not Tim Beck's yeah. offense. And, 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 he was and saying what, exactly right. that. He was and saying he it said, isn't Tim Beck's right. offense. And what he said yesterday, yeah. in the, what he, which is accurate, what he said Monday in the press conference, I loved it yeah. because that's what I want to hear from I, a guy on one that one side one. of the ball to say, look, if you want someone to blame, blame me. Like, okay, I agree. I want to know where the Bucks stops offensively, yeah. regardless of who's calling the play or yeah. whatever. So I know who to blame. As you say, yeah. Rod, when fit hits the Shan, yeah. who needs to raise their hand and say, yes, this is my it's responsibility. And then he reiterated, looked at Texas fans and said, Texas fans, blame me, and blame yeah. us. And for, you know... Which I love. I look, you guys <laughs> I like know, it. you guys know, and anybody listening to the show, anybody that's followed my work at Horse 24 7 knows, I was not a big Sean Watson <laughs> fan when Charlie Strong hired him. I didn't like the hire. No. Just thought it wasn't going to work. I was not a fan. But, and I didn't give him a pass for year one, but going into year two, what did we say all that offseason? All right, if you're going to stick with the same guy, you want to ride with him, that's fine. But you better be different. You better put some kind of different product out there than what we saw last year. And they year. said you, they were going to be different. And it was the same thing. And it was, and it was an even, it was a yeah. worse version of what it was we saw a, the year it, before. They basically had the same product. They put different packaging around it, but it was the same damn thing as it right. was. Yeah. Even the, even the players said that. Remember the players mm-hmm. admitted like, well, we're doing the same stuff. It's like, yeah. it's like you say. We sped it up. But it was the same it's thing. like you say, oh, we've got this great new soda. No, it's not. You took a Dr. Pepper can and slapped the <laughs> exactly. label on it. It's exactly. Just same old Dr. Is. Pepper. Yeah. Nothing yeah. against Dr. Pepper, but you guys get what I'm saying. Damn Zelensky Auto Parts. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> all, all I want is the GD box. Yes. Uh, I could take a crap in a box and slap guaranteed on it. Uh, but anyway, uh, got me off track a little bit. But no, Sorry. I, I, I was. That's what I was thinking towards with Sean Watson going into your tech. You better show something different. And to me, right, it's no different than Tom Herman and Tim Beck. If Tom Herman made a gamble by bringing back the, the same staff, he valued staff continuity over changing things up. Which, if you, if you want to do that. That's fine if if you think that's the best way to run your program and for the future of the program. Of changes though. He brought in Herb Hand. He moved Corby Meek as the wide yeah, receiver, but the the, the tweaks, b- tweaks, tweaks, tweaks. Right. Tweaks. There were no wholesale changes. No. And if you want to do that, that's fine. You're you're with the head coach or well, then you're right yeah. to do that. But you better put out a better product than what we saw last year. And as you said, that's the one thing you can really take issue with with this offensive staff last year. They were not ready for the counterpunch. Especially yeah. go back to this Maryland game last year. They weren't. When they got hit in the mouth, they were not ready for anything that happened there after and it was just there were too many games last year where it felt like as you pointed out rod they're just kind of calling plays yeah. trying to figure out what might work rather than here is this package of plays that we know in this situation against exactly. such and such coverage or such and such front or we're, such and such yeah. series of blitzes we know we feel like these will work yeah they didn't seem prepared for a lot of the adjust- and maybe that's because they didn't feel like they had any counter punches right you know maybe they felt like they were out of punches because the offense was so bereft of talent at certain positions and they were discombobulated because they had had no offensive identity. I just think for Longhorn fans watching, that's the one thing that they're craving, that they're thirsting for. You know, we've had one offensive identity, I think, in the last eight years on the 40 Acres, and that was the Deontay Foreman, Sterling Gilbert, Veer and Shoot, Shane Bouchelle year in 2016. Other than that, there is no year you can look at since Colt McCoy left where you go, oh, no, that was the defined offensive identity. The beautiful thing about it, on the defensive side, you have Tart Orlando, who has a clear defensive identity. Like It was, it was like a parent in the first like four, four or five games, right. and that was even with the Maryland debacle, that you knew, number one, he's going to stop the run and make him one-dimensional. Number two, he's going to pressure the hell out of the quarterback in a ton of different ways. And number three, he's going to force turnovers. It was literally yep. in that. And then maybe I can also score touchdowns too. I mean, it was <laughs> his modus operandi was, was clear. And on the offensive side, if somebody asked me, and I used to go on national talk shows, and they'd be like, so uh, offensively, what's Texas trying to do? I'm like, yeah, I, don't, I don't know what the hell are they trying to do. Yeah, I'm glad, you know, it's a Sam Ellinger show pretty much. And that's what I called it last year. I think that's what Texas fans are ultimately trying to identify. At least that's what I'm trying to identify in this game. And like you said, they've had a whole entire offseason to work on it. And the, the interesting thing is that Tom Herman has a, a defensive coordinator that is so extraordinary, in, in most people's opinion, including mine, that he could have the Lincoln Rally type you know, mentality where, man, I'm focusing on offense. You got defense, right? You got that? You good? 
You got it. All right, cool. I'm going to do offense and special teams, man. I, You know, when you need me on defense, when I see a couple of breakdowns, I'm going to come over and holler at you. But other than that, you good, right? You got that? All right, cool. You know what I mean? He really could have that mentality because he had that luxury, I should say, with Todd Orlando. Yeah. So I don't even know. So I, I, this year, I just wonder how it'll go. If if ten, if it doesn't look good in the Maryland game, I guess if the offense does not look good, you know what Longhorn fans, the number one criticism is going to be. Yep. What the hell happened to the <laughs> offense? I thought it was going to be better. Why is it not better? So I think there are so many different ways to try to improve it, and that's what I'll give Tom Herman credit for. Brought in Herb Hand to help with the offensive line. Uh, the, the running back position, I said it was the uh, worst position in terms of talent on the 40 acres uh, this past spring. They brought in Trey Watson. Uh, they brought in Calvin Anderson also with the offensive line. And I think Danny uh, Young will be better. I, I, I'm not going to sleep on him. And I know yeah. uh, when I joined you on the Rodcast Rod uh, on, on Monday, which, by the way. And we criticized wide receivers a lot last year. He made a change there, too. Tom Lemon did everything he wanted to do. He, like, he needed to do, I should By the way, during the season, I'll be on with Rod uh, Mondays and Thursdays from, from 2, two to three, 3 on nice. the Rodcast, nice. chopping it up. Um, um, we kind of agree to disagree on Danny Young. I think he leads this team in rushing. I think it's right around 700 yards. I, I think he's going to be the workhorse back uh, of that stable. I don't know if there's a workhorse on this. I, I think it's going to be Ross Danny Young. Right I'm, th- I'm taking all my chips, and I'm pushing them in the middle of the table of workhorse, on Danny I Young. Say. I think he's a 20 to 25 carry a game back. Oh, there's no guy on this team that's a 20 to 25. I think, I think, I think well, that's his ceiling. But if we're looking not at yet. the numbers Keontae right now, be, if you were to combine, say, Trey Watson's projected uh, rushes and Young, Projected rushes is that's 25.3. 25. Yeah, exactly. So it's like that's yeah. sort of like if, and then you can have your specialty back or third yeah, down back. Be, that's going to get be a like true your committee. five. So, but opinion. if he's saying that he feels he's the workhorse guy, if you're talking about 30 rushes and you're going to disperse like say five and eight, that's still like getting a good 17 for college. If you no, multiply no, 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 17 by yeah. 13, get that out there, you're talking 200 plus. Texas hasn't had a guy getting around that. You're talking a thousand yard rusher. That's a Deontay Foreman's the only guy in like. Yeah, I'm not saying Danny. Right. Young's going to get 20-25. to 25. I'm saying he's capable of if you wanted to put that I on I think him. ultimately the running back position ends up being like wide receiver last year where, hell, it's almost a different guy every week. That's You're like, oh, damn, he got – I know he was going to step up and have 98 yards this week. Yeah, and that Even big the thing, Chris Warren experiment, we know like they didn't really know what the hell was going on in running back. They just kept throwing stuff at wall to see if it's, it's stuck. And if Young has that versatility, though, if you look at, like, say, a guy like – if you look at just upside in skill set, a guy like Young, really good as a receiver, probably a guy that can pick up pass blocking concepts. He's been in similar type offenses as, you know, I mean, four years in college college already compared to Young who has been a moving around inside this offense maybe in second year here maybe able to pick it up quicker but you talk about a guy like him if he can do those other things around being the workhorse back then he'll earn that playing time but that's the main thing is the playing time might just be dispersed because you got these platooning bodies and they know yeah. just a modern concept of using the running back position you don't want to have a guy bludgeoning his head in there 20 straight times because he's not going to be fresh at the end of the year um, let's go to the defense right because you we talked about defense and you said it I agree with you if you got players you can have a good defense and you look at the talent on this defense and the experience uh we'll include Anthony Wheeler's numbers but again thankfully this is the last time we get to say this Anthony Wheeler suspended for the first half of the Maryland game because of this targeting penalty he got in the bowl game which is asinine in and of itself but that's another conversation for another day <laughs> you've got 140 career combined career starts by your starting 11 on defense and that's with Caden Stearns having never started a game as a true freshman yeah. at safety so Rod You've got players, you've got experience, you've got a scheme from Todd Orlando that you know is going to work. Here's my big question with this Maryland game, whether it's Kasim Hill or Tyrell Pigram, uh, unless something crazy happens between now and then, it's it's allegedly going to be Kasim Hill as a starting quarterback. Can this defense handle a dual-threat quarterback, a true dual-threat quarterback? Because last year, Tyrell Pigram ate this defense alive. And granted, the defense we saw in Week 1 against Maryland and the defense we saw in Game 13 against Missouri, two completely different defenses in terms of confidence, understanding of the scheme, fundamentals, etc. Very good sign. But when you start to look at the numbers, I go back to this. I wrote this after the Maryland game last year. In the Charlie Strong era, Texas was 4-10 against quarterbacks who were either first or second on their team in rushing yards. Yeah, I remember 
Yeah, breaking that down like a couple of years ago. Yeah, I mean, that was just uh, Charlie, that was Charlie Strong's week. But you know what? It was Mac Brown's too. Mac, go back to Mac Brown. You can take it even further than that hmm. and go back to Mac That's Brown's last t- year. That skill set does that. That's where the stat came from initially because it was going against Marcus Mariota uh, that year and Taysom Hill and all those guys. That's where the stat came from. Well, last year, even, last even year Mac too. Brown, because basically go from 2013 and 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 take that stat mm-hmm. um, which all I, the way to would, Taysom. Yeah, which 20, I started all the way back then. Yeah, well, first or second on your team in rushing, and 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 that's 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 re- that's really a dual threat guy. I mean, that's a guy who's actually probably a prominent rusher on the team. Not a probably as a prominent rusher on the team and one of the best dual threat quarterbacks in the country. If you can be in that statistical area, mm-hmm. Texas played a ton of those guys in 2013 and like 20. 14 and 15, yep. and they didn't do well against them. And honestly, I don't think any defensive coordinator can handle it. Honestly, the truth is, that is the that skill, that set. Is, that, that skill set, you could argue, has been the kryptonite for even the Nick Saban Superman True. model. It's like the that's one the only people that took him down was Cam Newton and Johnny Manziel and Deshaun Watson. Those are the only quarterbacks that can even take True. him down. And then also those quarterbacks. Set, who beat the greatest team, arguably, in the history of college football, USC. It was a dual-threat quarterback, one of the greatest. That's the only way, really, that you can break down the Superman model of a great team. Because that guy's a great equalizer, which is why Tom Herman ultimately went with Sam, Sam Ellinger. Ellinger. Has that upside. <laughs> Uh, but you look at this defense, guys, and I think this is a really good challenge. Not to say that Maryland is a juggernaut running the football, but they ran for 263 in Austin last year. It was the, yeah. by far the most Texas yep. gave up on the ground. The next closest was TCU, and TCU had like 177, and I think they were under for a carry in yeah, that game. But I think there were, look at some of those Kenny Hill There were a couple runs, Kenny Hill scrambles that, yeah, yeah he had a couple, a couple big third-down chunk yardage. Yeah. yeah, so it's not like this team was getting gashed on the ground thereafter. But, Rod, you talk about the dual-threat quarterback element. It was Pigram and Hill in that Maryland game, Man. Alex Delton in the K-State game. Wow. So yeah, I forgot about that. That's really the next step. If you're saying, okay, what's next for this defense? To me, it's that. Can you can you neutralize a dual threat quarterback and make them like <laughs> it's it's something I remember. Is I w- there is there well, a way to do it? No, but, just, no. but like, this is this is where I'm going with this. I was watching the All or Nothing series on Amazon with the Cowboys because yeah. I'm a Cowboys fan. Yeah, and they're getting ready to play Green Bay and Jason Garrett and Rod Marinelli are watching Aaron Rodgers film and they're telling the defense make him play from the pocket, make him play mm-hmm. from the pocket. Well, hell, if everybody figured that out, Aaron Rodgers wouldn't be other than Tom Brady, maybe the greatest Aaron quarterback, quarterback of this generation. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> He's so, so quick that he chooses just, yeah. to play just outside. Make him play the from pocket. the pocket. Just, just make yeah. him play from the pocket. I, saying, I know coach, defensive coordinators act like it's so simple. Hey, man, you know what? Keep, keep that guy from the sidelines. Yeah. Keep him contained. It's like, oh, well, if I can keep Saquon Barkley contained, coach, you wouldn't yes. need Saquon freaking Barkley. Exactly. All right. <laughs> so, so don't we'll, let Randy Moss beat you deep. He's Randy Moss. You better wrap up on Barry Sanders, <laughs> Rod. If this, if this, if this Texas defense. <laughs> If this Texas defense is going to be vulnerable anywhere, I think it's going to be right up the gut at the point of attack because you don't have Puna Ford anymore. Oh, no. And you lose Malik and I'm stuff. really interested to see what a 282-pound Malcolm Roach looks like at middle linebacker because that's probably where he's going to start in this game. He's a junk. Like, he looks like, I'll tell you, he looks like junkyard dog out there. It sounds like a, a violent weapon. Yeah, let's, yeah, let's, let's get him a chain. chain. Yeah. Yeah. He looks like junkyard dog. I mean, the whole body. And junkyard dog was very athletic. I think junkyard Rest in dog, peace, JYD. He probably easily could be, yeah. I'm going to have to Google this, linebacker. dude. Backer. Uh, you know- you remember Junkyard? Is he a wrestler? I yes. Assume. Okay. Dance. See, remember, y'all forget I don't watch wrestling, uh, so like, right. I just have learned uh, so much from y'all. <laughs> but to no, but to your point, I I agree with you about the defense. You know, I don't know if there are going to be a lot of vulnerabilities with this Todd Orlando defense, but that could easily be one, just from all the reasons that we just talked about. I don't know if anybody has an antidote to uh, to that a, a true dual threat quarterback having a great game. Logan fans got a chance to watch it a few times versus Charlie Strong and with Mac Brown is in the last years of Mac Brown, but this with the spread concepts, with the up tempo, with RPOs now with all these offensive advantages. Like the defense is su- they are, are such a disadvantage. And then you throw in a plus one, the, maybe the best athlete on the field now, sometimes at quarterback. Mm-hmm. I mean, what the hell? What, what, what do you want me to do? I think some defense corner just throw their hands up. And unfortunately, Texas this year, if you're bringing this up, you want to take it even further. The Big 12 this year may have one of the best crop of running quarterbacks they've had in a long time. True. Sean Robinson, Kyler Murray. 
Uh, of course, uh, Alex Delton uh, with K State. Right. Like they got some guys in the Big Twelve. Charlie Brewer at Baylor. Charlie Brewer at Baylor yeah. has functional mobility. He can move around. So you actually Kemp at Iowa State is kind of yeah. He can yeah. He can move around a little bit. Kind of that functional mobility thing. So mm-hmm. yeah, you got guys that and yeah. So I, and, and they're combined with a lot of good running backs also in the Big Twelve. Yeah, if you're looking for something that could potentially be uh, something worrisome for that title Lando defense, I think you hit the nail on the head there. Yeah, that's and, why this is a really good test yeah. for this defense. Right and, out of and, the they, and they play, they, they're about assignment football. So they'll break it down and basically start running option on you. And Since they got that, and basically all they need is a crease, all they need is one guy to miss an assignment, and boom, they can break it big. Right. And that's where Texas' pass rush will be so big because if you're talking about a guy that's trying to extend plays, it's like the only time that you can take away a dual threat quarterback is those first four seconds before he's a dual threat quarterback if your pass rush can get to him and make that decision be out of necessity for him to evade the rush instead of by choice to go out there and extending options. So if Texas is able to replenish that D-line and be able to get pressure from the back like they did before and be able to confuse the looks to where you can get there in four seconds, then you won't have to worry. But then if they aren't able to do that, which they did a ton last year, which made Texas defense so good last year, then you might be in trouble because then you're on that other quarterback's clock instead of him playing on your defense's clock. You just brought it up, though. The D-line for Tyler Lando is supposed to be one of the best D-lines he's had as a defensive coordinator. I mean, I've done the research. He he's hadn't had a lot of great D-lines. Even yeah. with Ed Oliver there, I don't know if you have as much all-around talent and depth as you do here with Brecken Hager and Charles Amenahu and you know Chris Nelson up there up front. And even, I think, Malcolm Roach. I include him in the defensive front because he's just so damn big. So, I agree with you. I, I think uh, the the D-line, if there's anything that can help them out, it would be the D-line as opposed to with the going up against the rushing right. quarterbacks. Uh, as we move into predictions and time to give our predictions for this game, oh, kind man. of the game within the game. Oh, don't forget about Ty Johnson, too. We didn't, we're talking about dual threat quarterbacks. Hmm. They got, I mean, that guy's an explosive run in the backfield. Yeah, oh, exactly. Ty Johnson? Yeah. Yeah, from Maryland. I mean, Averaging, I think, I think like seven and a half a yeah, carry for his career. Yeah, number, man. Yeah. He averaged. So he didn't get a lot of action, but he, man, well, I he think, got it. Well, I think the problem with Ty Johnson last year was once you were down to, like, you know, the towel boy playing quarterback, you really lose the element of surprise at that point. You yeah. don't have that other element you've got with it's the, true. you know, where you can do different things at the mesh point and move him around. He kind of yeah. just have to roll with that what guy's you got. An explosive game. Very player. tough to stop in the pass game. Yeah, and and four four starters coming back on the offensive line for Maryland, and that to me is the game within the game. It's the chess match between Todd Orlando and Matt Canada because right. even the Maryland Riders, like nobody really knows what. Matt Canada's going to do. Like traditionally, he's been a two tight end, real similar to Brian Harson. Double tight ends, a Mm -hmm. lot of motion, a lot of funk, funk, but you want to be a physical, hard nosed running team, and you're going from. You know, a guy, Walt Bell, who was a spread guy who's now with Willie Taggart at Florida State, it's, yeah, you might want to be that, but do you have the personnel to be that? And, yeah, how, you right. know, what? Is, I, that's what Todd Orlando really has to figure out is what is Matt Canada going to do? What's he going to try to be with this personnel? And then try to go after him from there. That's yeah. going to be a really intriguing chess match. No, no, I think, you, I think you're right. I, to me, you know, on the defensive side for Texas, I do. I want to see how Todd Orlando matches up with this group and what he does really to um, anticipate whatever Matt Cannon's going to do. Because like you said, the mystery, I think, is one of the biggest advantages for Maryland right now offensively. That mystery, because you have no idea right. what, what they're going to do. Nobody, you're watching LSU film, for God's sakes. Like, that's not an accurate... Like I know you want to just see his philosophy and ideology, but that's not an accurate depiction and of what he's going to do at Ma- all. Maryland <laughs> Spring Game TV copy is going to give you personnel. That, that's yeah, pretty much it. That's pretty much it. You know, that's the vanilla as it yeah. gets. I mean, yeah. All right, let's go ahead and make some predictions. Matt, what is the official spread as of right now on this game? It is minus 13 Texas over under at 56 and a half. Okay. Minus 13. Yeah, that's because Maryland's – we haven't talked about that, but the, the program's in disarray. Yeah. Now, when the Durkin is, suspension is, happened, it went from 11 and a half to – it's been floating around 13, 13 yeah, and a half, so it moved exactly. to two points. And, and they still haven't really figured out, resolved it. They're still investigating. DJ yeah. Durkin's still on administrative leave, so Matt Cannon's going to be – and that's one thing, too. Will he be focused totally on the offense? Because now he's the head coach and the OC. A lot yeah. of stuff going on. You know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. That's and, a lot going on. And that. a lot of reverse line movement towards Texas because you've seen Texas grow as a favorite, but you've seen the over-under go down. It's went down from 58 
to 56 and a half. So if they're thinking Texas is going to win by more and there's going to be less points, that's double in Texas' favor. Uh, Matt, what say you about this game? I got Texas going 35-20. I think they'll barely okay. co- cover. And if you look at Texas, Tom Herman doesn't like to kick field goals in the first place. It's just the numbers game. It's better to go for the big touchdowns in Texas. Doesn't, you know, have, might have another question mark at kicker. So all TDs for the Horns. Okay. Rod Babers, what you got? Uh, yeah, I got the Longhorns winning. I think it's a statement game for the coaching staff. I mean, like I said, they weren't out coached a lot last year, but uh, they were out coached versus Maryland. Maryland just had a better game plan coming into the game. I think Todd Orlando has circled this game. He's going to take it personal. Uh, Tom Herman and Tim Beck. Hopefully, it's uh, we see fruit from this this marriage uh, between the two as basically co play callers. So I think Texas wins. I think they win by. Two touchdowns. I, they should win by. I got them winning by maybe sixteen. So I'll take them thirty-six to twenty. Uh, Matt, I'm with you. I don't think we'll see a lot of Texas field goals in this game. Right along the same lines. To me, this is a game about. It's a statement game for the program in terms of is this a mature program? Is this like a that. program? Because you look at last year's yeah. Maryland game. They got up seven nothing, and then they took their foot off the gas. And now. With, we could talk about the stuff surrounding Maryland and how are they going to come out. You know how the best way for Texas to combat that? Come out, punch them right in the face, and give them no hope right off the bat. <laughs> because with the fragile psyche of that program right now, if they do get punched right in the mouth, do they just kind of crater and give in, and yeah. then you're off to the races. Yeah. If Texas handles their business, they don't focus on the outside noise and just focus on themselves and handling their business, Texas is the better football team. They should win this game. They will win this game. And I think Texas is going to end up covering. I got Texas winning this game 28-13. Um, I love your point about maturity. I think it's one of the best points anybody's made about this matchup because last year, the Texas had so many big plays where I think they were pre, they, they prematurely believed, like, oh, we got to win this game. Mm-hmm. Like, you know what I mean? They had the non-offensive You scored touchdowns. three non-offensive touchdowns you know I mean? and lost. Yeah. So you had, like, so many, like, as a for a young team, these roller coaster moments where they're just like, oh, man, hell yeah. We gotta also, win. We're Texas, baby. That's what we do. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, I didn't even think I was like, damn, I guess we are gonna win. It's crazy. Like, how do you, how often do you get a non-offensive touchdown? And then how many how many times do you have multiple non-offensive touchdowns three, in the game? Three and lose and by still ten points. Lose by double digits. Because to me, I'm with you. I think totally they just they they started to believe the own hype like during the game. Like, yep. hell man, we basically already won. We just gotta show up. Emblematic um, of the season right there. The yeah, roller coaster. Not, not ride. That those those touchdowns weren't weren't well deserved or well earned, but I think it kind of psychologically it did a number on a very yeah. young football team so I agree with you about the maturity thing don't beat yourself right you know what I mean they say part of being mature is just showing up to work on time you'll be able to keep your job most of the damn time just <laughs> be mature you know what I mean like just Milton. It, don't beat yourself I think it, all the points you made are right on the money about the maturity for it all right we'll see what happens 11 a.m FedEx field Texas and Maryland kicking off year two of the Tom Herrera Matt thanks for everything man you're more than welcome Rod B appreciate the time and the knowledge anytime brother anytime for Matt, for Rod, for everybody at 1049 the Horn, hornfm.com, AM 1260, 1019, worldwide on the Horn app. And at our, <coughs> let me redo that. For Matt, for Rod, for everybody at the Austin Radio Network and the Horn, 1049, 1019, AM 1260, worldwide on the Horn app and at hornfm.com, where you can hear Rod B each and every weekday on the Rodcast from 1 to 3. Shameless plug. And thanks to Matt, you get us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, anywhere you get your podcasts, and always get our archives on the Longhorn Blitz SoundCloud page. Yep, just type in Longhorn Blitz. For the Horn family, for the Horns 24-7 family, I'm Jeff Howe. Thank you so much for downloading and listening, and we will catch you again on the next episode. You've been listening to Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Remember, for the latest Longhorn news 24-7, visit Horns247.com.